tonight is Dr. Mike Carson, archaeologist here at the University of Guam. And Mike has done a lot of updates, uh, more specifically with research that he's done at Ritekten, or Ritidian. And so the work of archaeologists, I always say, is very important to adding and contributing the ongoing narrative of the history of the people of the Mariana Islands. And Mike has worked not only here on Guam, he's also worked in the Northern Marianas in Tinian, over at uh, Tagasai and also in Saipan, and I'm sure he will touch up on some of that, but he's definitely advanced our understanding of a period that we've only known very little of. And so I want you to put your hands together, please, and welcome Dr. Mike Carson. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming out uh, this evening. I know it's inconvenient sometimes. I'm just very happy to see people are interested. Tonight I want to talk about uh, what we can learn from archaeology in our modern world uh, today. Uh, this, so this presentation will be a little bit different from what I usually do when I'm talking about uh, archaeological sites, you know, new, new discoveries of what we found in certain places and in artifact inventories or museum collections. This is a little bit different. This is uh, a little bit conceptual, talking about uh, some intellectual concepts of what makes archaeology important, how do we know what we think we know, and how is that relevant or important or meaningful in the modern world. We often think of archaeology as, you know, people like me digging in the dirt and uh, finding old things. And what's the value of that? You know, why, why are you interested in these old things? That's from the past and that's dead and gone. And why, you know, why, why are you digging up these, these old things uh, that really are not relevant to our modern lives? But in, in fact, they are relevant. And finding old things uh, is important in, in archaeology. In fact, our field work of excavation is like the heart and soul of archaeology. And this picture here is the uh, Aroti area in the naval base. This is under several meters, actually, of a coral fill in order to reach the base where we have, can find the, the archaeological deposits. Sometimes you do all that effort and find uh, no archaeological deposit, but you find something else, which is uh, information about where the ancient coastline was or what kinds of shellfish used to exist in this uh, embayment area uh, during ancient times. So you do learn really important information about the environment uh, and sometimes about archaeology. And is it worthwhile uh, to do all these things? And the answer, of course, is uh, yes, yes it is. But there's basic facts that we gain from, from this kind of fieldwork effort, and th those can be interpreted uh, in different ways. Uh, you're probably familiar with, you know, the deeper you go underground, finding these different archaeological layers, the older things are. Uh, this image shows you uh, one site in uh, Saipan where there's a, a number of layers. Uh, each one of those we can document in chronological order. And then you tell the story of what had happened in this place uh, throughout time. For example, we can identify the lowest layer and have good direct dating on uh, when it started and when it ended, and within that time range, in this case starting at 1500 BC and continuing through 1100 BC, I can tell you exactly what kinds of pottery people were using, what kinds of stone tools and shells and other things people uh, had in their inventory and in their life, as well as what the environment looked like in, in that place. Then you go to the next layer, and it's the same, the same thing. You continue the story through time. I won't give you all the details uh, right here. That will take a very long time. But you get the idea that you build these sequences of what did you find through time and tell a story of you know, what happened in the natural history and in the cultural history of whatever site you, you happen to be investigating. And then you can coordinate these uh, different lines of evidence, uh, importantly, in chronological order. And these lines of evidence could be the geological layers themselves, or it could be the things you find in those layers, such as the pottery and other artifacts, the kinds of foods that people ate, uh, what the climate was like, what the sea level was like at that time. Possibly you can learn about population size and density. And I'm sure you could think of many more 
things like perhaps the social organization or political structure. When you start getting into those realms, then you need to interpret uh, the data a little bit more. Uh, my work mostly is with the factual uh, evidence, you know, looking at the actual hard things that you can hold in your hand, you know, broken pieces of pottery and stone tools and aspects of the physical uh, landscape where, where people lived. And so the closer you are to that hard data or the objective data, the, the, the stronger you can be about your conclusions, you know, the less interpretation you need to have. But interpretation is important. You know, we want to know what people were thinking and feeling. We want to know about their uh, religious beliefs and their social organization. So we just need to be really clear about what we know for sure in the facts versus what we are interpreting. So in order to do that, we need to be aware of what archaeology is. Uh, as, as I've shown you, you know, digging uh, in layers and making sure you're very clear about what materials belong to specific time periods. So getting to our question of uh, tonight's lecture, you know, what can we learn from archaeology today? Uh, the, the primary strength of archaeology, uh, well, there's two strengths. One is the, that material evidence that we can find, and the second is having a long-term chronological perspective on things. Uh, and uh, this, this is also shared with uh, history. So many historians uh, the last few years have been looking at things like uh, how did certain situations uh, arise, like looking at the, the origins of like, uh, fascist regimes in, in Europe and other parts of the world and saying, how, how did that happen? And how can we make sure that doesn't happen again? You know, we don't want to repeat those mistakes. So uh, we look for what are the, how, how did different political regimes happen? Or, how, or what are the warning signs? And how, how can we make sure that we don't repeat those mistakes? And uh, maybe if we can identify the causes of these problems, then we can find a effective uh, solution to these problems. And that, that applies to other things as well, like climate change, or increasing sea level. If we can look to not only historical records, but archaeological records, then we can be in a good position to plan ahead for our future. Uh, right now, you may have heard about the, the recent release of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, their latest report is quite scary about uh, we, we have only a few decades remaining to uh, change our course of action about uh, climate in the world. So if we can look to archaeological records of how people have coped with climate change and sea level change in the past, uh, both successfully and unsuccessfully, uh, then we can be in, in a better informed position to change our, our way of thinking and our policies uh, going into the future. It's not just uh, climate change, there's, there's many other things uh, that, that you could be addressing and it's just a matter of, you know, what, what is your interest? Um, not everybody is interested in climate change and, and sea level. You need to think about uh, what is significant. You know, what are we learning that's new and changing the way we think uh, about the world? And in order to do that, uh, archaeologists, the, the nature of our work is with specific material things from specific sites. So, for example, uh, in Guam, we would want to know what, just first of all, what happened? Uh, in Guam at, say, 1500 BC or at uh, 1000 BC or, or any other date. You know, we want to know what happened, just the basic facts of, of the archaeological record. And then we can start to uh, compare with, with other areas and with our larger knowledge. Uh, what I'll talk about today is more about uh, uh, sea level change and coastal ecology. That's something we can document very well in Guam. So if, if I can find an archaeological record of at different time periods of what was the coastal ecology like and how did things change, then is that information meaningful? Uh, is it relevant for some of the issues we face today in, in the world? And in, in fact, it is. You know, uh, coastal environments are fundamental to most, most of the world's population in terms of agricultural productivity, uh, economic trade, and then so many other things. So if we can look at a real life example of say the last few thousands of years in Guam about how people adjusted to changing coastal ecologies and sea level, then we, we can actually contribute something significant and meaningful that is relevant for some of these situations we're facing uh, today in, in the world. 
So it, it starts with actually finding that physical evidence from, from the ground and then trying to link that physical evidence with that concept, right? So that, what I'm showing in the diagram here, that arrow between the, uh, the uh, trowel digging up uh, artifacts and then the brain thinking about it, that, that connection is, is uh, quite important. Um, and as I uh, hinted earlier in this presentation, I'd like to, at least myself, I'd like to stay as close as possible to the physical data. Because in, in that way, I'm, being, uh, I'm observing the data and being objective uh, about my work. And then the, level, the layers of interpretation are, are minimized and importantly clarified. You know, being really clear about why am I confident in making certain interpretations or, in cl or conclusions about uh, the raw data. And I like to share all of my data as, as well, you know, so other people can look at it and, and come to their own conclusions. And so you can think uh, what kinds of questions uh, are relevant and meaningful in, in our modern world. Um, I mentioned climate and sea level, but there are other, other things. Uh, population growth and especially population uh, densities uh, are becoming a, a major issue uh, worldwide uh, in that there are many parts of the world that have these insanely dense populations and other places that are very low density population. And uh, how can we distribute our resources and our opportunities uh, for, for every, everyone to, to have you know, equal uh, advantage? Um, there's some concerns about what happens when you have new uh, religious doctrines or beliefs uh, that suddenly uh, influence uh, uh, different regions and uh, different having different you know religious beliefs and diversity is generally a good thing, but uh, often uh, things get misinterpreted. And archaeologists, not not myself, but others uh, working uh, in Egypt and other places, have been starting to look at that that question of uh, how how do religions change the way we we think and how does it affect uh, different aspects of our society? Uh, another one, of course, would be uh, warfare. Uh, war, uh, wars generally are things that uh, we want to avoid and in the archaeological record we have plenty of examples of conflict and violence and battlefields and other things and if archaeologists can learn about uh, what happens leading up to uh, warfare and conflict situations, then perhaps that will help us to uh, avoid those kinds of situations in the future. You know, understanding how those things happened is important for developing effective solutions uh, in, in the future. And I'm sure you can think of many other things that are problems in, in our modern world. And it, you can think of it this way. If, if the historical context about something is, is helpful to make sense of how, how a problem happened or how, how to solve it, then archaeology also could be helpful looking in a long-term uh, perspective with real tangible uh, examples. And today I will talk about just a little bit of, of some of this at the uh, Ritidian or uh, Litexan site in northern Guam. Uh, if you haven't been there, then it's right there at the northern end of Guam. A uh, beautiful place. This view is looking across uh, the channel to uh, Rota. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the story of the child's leap going across to Rota. This isn't the exact spot where that happened in, in the legend, but it uh, evokes that uh, uh, aspect. At the Guam National Wildlife Refuge, I was able to find uh, repeated uh, evidence about the changing uh, sea level and coastline that y you can actually visit today and uh, everyone can see it and experience it. Not just along the coastline, but also in the archaeological excavations by being careful about where I excavated, uh, how deep it was in the ground, and what kind of sediment I was finding, and even digging deep enough to find the old coral uh, reefs. Uh, that's exactly the kind of information we need to reconstruct what the landscape looked like at different times of changing uh, sea level and coastal e ecology. And it's not just the, the coast that is changing, it's also uh, the artifacts changing uh, through time. And I won't go into detail right now, but uh, the last uh, about uh, 20 years, uh, we've had very solid evidence of a higher sea level that existed uh, actually throughout the world uh, between 3,000 
uh, BC and 1000 BC. And in the Pacific region in particular is very, very well documented. But of course it changes a little bit, from, you know, here to there and, and through time. So we, we present it as uh, what we call an envelope. That's, that envelope is represented by the boundaries of this uh, dashed line on this diagram. And then specifically at uh, Retidian site, uh, we're able to verify it uh, right within the boundary of, of that envelope. Um, and, and, and then again, verified the same thing in, in other sites of Guam and in the Mariana Islands. So we can be very sure uh, if I find a site that dates to a specific point on this timeline, I can already know what the sea level was at, at that time. Right, so you already have that built-in uh, reference point. And then you can look for uh, verifying information just to be sure in that particular place. But working at the Litexan site has been uh, especially helpful because many of our observations about changing sea level are directly at that site and even from the archaeological excavations themselves. So we can be very sure of coordinating things uh, like this. So I can show what the landscape looked like when people first uh, lived in the region, around between 1500 BC and 1100 BC uh, would have been the, the limestone formations coming essentially right down to the edge of the ocean and people living in just a, a few small spots. And then with uh, sea level starting to change, actually becoming a little bit lower, and then the coast is expanding and people are living in a larger area, and then those, those trends continue until there's a new coral reef forming, which is the reef that you can see today. Uh, and people, by the time of the Ladi period, and people are living in Ladi villages, there's more, uh, more intensive land use over a much larger area. So you can put this whole sequence together. And then look at the different lines of evidence. This is looking at just the, uh, the pottery uh, traditions at different time periods, and coordinating those uh, pottery with, with other things. Uh, but, but I want to point out one thing, just in the pottery sequence itself, is continuous. You know, certain uh, traditions or styles were popular for a while, you know, for a number of centuries, in fact. And then other things uh, started coming in to, to people's, uh, you know, orbit or their inventory of what they were making. And then those became more popular while others faded out. So this is this continuous uh, change in the pottery traditions of, of uh, the Mariana Islands. And you can coordinate that with things like the sea level or the coastal ecology. So during that period of higher sea level, people were making certain kinds of pottery. They also were doing other certain kinds of things with, uh, with stone tools or shell ornaments. But this diagram is just about the pottery. And then during the next period of a falling sea level, that coordinates a little bit with some of the change in, in the pottery traditions, but certain aspects continued while, while others uh, changed. And then, you know, a temporary stability in sea level and uh, other coastal change and leading to the modern conditions. We can identify these different periods that, that, that each last a number of centuries. Uh, and each one of those periods is, is coordinated with what the coastal environment looked like, like in the previous diagram I showed you of the, the changing landscape. And then each one of those has its own assemblage of artifacts and, and other lines of evidence. You can look at what changed uh, in those different periods as well as uh, what had sustained through time. So if you're interested in uh, sustainable planning uh, for the future, then, you, then uh, both of those things are important. You need to know uh, what kinds of things are people able to do that continue and endure and sustain through changing times, you know, in this case changing uh, sea level and, and coastal ecology, and what, what things are people doing that really cannot survive, that are no longer relevant in their lives uh, w with too much of a threshold, you know, changing condition in, in their sea level and in their coastal ecology. And you could apply th this logic to, to other things. Um, if you're interested in population dynamics or forest composition, you could apply this lo logic to, to those things. I'm just showing you one, one example uh, that I happen to know uh, from, from my research. And I mentioned uh, lines of evidence. Uh, this is very important. You need a full picture of what happened. If I'm looking only at the, the pottery like I showed you, then, then I can address only certain kinds of questions. If I broaden my lines of evidence, 
then I can talk about more things. Uh, what I'm showing here is you know, a few of the things that we're able to study clearly in the archaeological record, like the climate, the kinds of resource habitats, uh, the artifact uh, technology, the food supply, uh, population size, social organization, sometimes we can address, but not always. And, and there's many other things uh, that, that we could uh, try to uh, find in the archaeological record. Uh, but if, if our window is, is too shallow, like say we, we dig only a little bit and we find, say, the last 100 years or, or 200 years or the last 500 years even of the archaeological record, then we're not really looking at change through time. We can't really address uh, what was sustainable. Uh, we need a much deeper uh, look into the past. And if we have fragmented data, like we have some time periods and some pieces of evidence, then that, that, that's important. Uh, it, it does help us to learn certain things, but if we want to look at how did people adapt and change with their, with their landscapes through time, then we, we really do need the whole picture. Um, and, and then you identify the, the correlations in your lines of evidence. So we look for periods where things changed, and did they all change at once? Or did some things change while other things remained the same? And also looking for periods when things did not change very much. So we're looking at the, the complete picture of uh, sustainability versus non-sustainability in, in our traditions. And the way I do my work is something, something like this. This is just you know, a, one example showing what the landscape would have looked like, you know, the shape. Of, uh, of the land uh, during a certain period where I knew the sea level was in a certain place and a water resource is also located there. Uh, and in, based on these kinds of models, you can start to interpret where did people gather uh, their different resources and how did they live in this landscape? What was their world like uh, from their perspective? So sort of letting the data tell the story uh, themselves. So instead of us reaching into the past and trying to interpret it, trying to let, let the past tell its own story, you know, and then do this in chronological order. So then flashing forward in time uh, with a change in sea level, you know, where did people move, you know, to live? And then sea level changing again, you know, the, the environment changes and, and, and the cultural environment changes as, as well. So putting that all, all together, you can look for uh, these different lines of evidence that give us the basis for a factual description of you know, what happened, right? And then, uh, depending on, on the limits of the evidence, we can make some logical interpretations about when sea level changed, people needed to move to different places or use different environments, or they needed to find different kinds of water supplies, you know, what did they do? Uh, and then the last uh, thing on here is that significant contribution. So I've been talking about sea level change, but there's, there's many other things uh, that you could address. Um, but making a significant contribution is uh, uh, sort of another topic, but I want to touch on it a, a little bit here um, because it does relate to my main, main point of what makes archaeology important uh, today. Um, so our, a significant finding is something new that changes the way we think uh, about the world. So if I find you know, one piece of pottery and it's just like every other piece of pottery I've ever found, uh, then it's not really changing the way I think about the world. If I find uh, a, a collection of pottery in a certain context about a changing sea level and coastal ecology, ah, then, then I'm on the right track toward making a significant contribution in changing the way I think about things. So part of this relates to the, the limits of the physical evidence. And I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, is uh, you know, archaeology, one of its strengths is, is that material basis, you know, working with things like you see here, you know, pieces of broken pottery and, and uh, uh, stone and shell tools like these, or even uh, bits of uh, uh, shell ornaments or uh, discarded shell remains, like from food remains and other things. Uh, those uh, pieces of hard evidence open windows to talk about other things. Um, so whatever your question is uh, that's important to you, whether it's sea level or climate, or whether it's uh, population dynamics, uh, how does this physical evidence help get to that, that question? 
and it may not. You know, there may, there may be problems in, in the logical link. And if that happens, then you need to, to address it. You know, find out you know, what other lines of evidence do you need. So this leads me to my next point of how can we improve or enhance our, our contributions. Um, as I mentioned before, if I uh, <clears throat> find a few pieces of pottery, then you know, very few people will be interested in reading a book about you know, three pieces of pottery. Right? They want to read uh, a book or, or learn something uh, that, that's more significant. So how can we do that? And generally there are three ways. Um, uh, the first is what I showed you earlier, having different lines of evidence. The more lines of evidence you have, uh, the more knowledgeable you are about the past and what changed in our natural and in our cultural history. The second thing I'll, is um, having a cross-regional perspective. So looking just at the, the Texan site is important, but what makes it more important is if I can look at other sites in other parts of, of the Asia and Pacific region, like in New Guinea or in Taiwan or in the Philippines or, or Okinawa, and saying, okay, at 1100 BC, there was a change in sea level in Guam and people responded in a certain way. That same sea level change happened at the same time in these other regions, so how did people respond there? So that, that's the power of the cross-regional perspective. Uh, the third thing we can do to improve or enhance our contribution is this long-term chronological perspective. And uh, I, I regard that as one of the primary strengths of archaeology, is having that long-term chronological perspective. And I, I, I believe we need to do more work on that. Not everybody is looking at chronology in, in the way that we could. It could be more powerful. And it's a, as I've shown you here, uh, that long-term perspective allows us to see what changed through time uh, versus what was sustainable through time. And that is really at the core of uh, making policies and planning uh, for the future. So those are the three ways we can en enhance um, our contributions. You know, there's the uh, multiple lines of evidence, there's the cross-regional perspective, and then the third point is the long-term chronological perspective. And most of my colleagues naturally would agree with me about, about those things. But then I would add a fourth one that uh, we often overlook, and that is uh, sharing information and having a public outreach and activities uh, and experiences for, for people who are not necessarily uh, archaeologists. So the example I will show you is at the Guam National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I encourage everyone uh, to contact the refuge to participate in some of their activities that they have. They're every week guided tours of the archaeological sites and other uh, resources at the refuge. Coming up later this month, the 20th, I believe, of, of October, on a Saturday, is a special event at the refuge. So I encourage everyone to just reach out and, and, and ask uh, what you can do to be involved. And there's many things you can learn. Uh, all of the staff, like uh, Jared here, are trained uh, with uh, about the archaeological and other resources of, of the place. And uh, Dr. Uh, Hiro Kuroshino, who I believe is in the audience today, uh, sometimes comes out to help. And here you can see him uh, demonstrating some of the children's activities. Uh, here is uh, just a closer view of, uh, of this large uh, continuous poster of the entire archaeological sequence uh, of the area. So and th this, this relates to a point I, I, I want to make about archaeologists have a responsibility to share information, uh, not, not just to make it available, but to make sure that it's accurate uh, and, and gets into the hands of the people who want to know about it. And then here's uh, my colleague Brian Leon Guerrero preparing a couple children uh, for their tour of a uh, Ladi village. Uh, there's, there's many activities and tours and things that, that can happen at this place. And I think it's just uh, a good example of what can be done uh, with an archaeological site, making the site itself into a living museum. We can provide the 
factual information for people, and then they can run with it on their own. Th this uh, public access program now has a, a life of its own. You know, the sta all of the staff are well trained in what to do respectfully, uh, leading uh, groups of people through the area. All you, all you need to do is contact and make sure that you're, you're part of a, a reg registered group uh, who, who can uh, have one of these experiences. It's uh, w one of those things that uh, I find quite rewarding, uh, seeing people go on these tours with their own ideas, right? So I, I can provide some information about the changing landscape and coastal ecology, but perhaps people are interested in, in quite different topics. And I, I think that that's, that's what we want to see, is people to developing their own ideas and using archaeology as, as uh, part of their toolkit uh, for, for their own knowledge and, and learning. Now getting back to our key question, what can we learn from archaeology today? Uh, what, I, what I've shown you here is uh, sort of being honest, first of all, about what archaeology is, you know, critiquing, not, not too seriously, but being critical, thinking about the, the limits of the data, you know, being material-based. But in fact, that's a good thing. You can turn that limitation in, into a strength, being factually based um, in, in your work. And then if you do that properly and you're honest about what the data are, then you can maximize the potential contributions. Like I showed about having multiple lines of evidence and the cross-regional perspective, a chronological perspective, you can maximize uh, the, the data. And then, of course, communicating factually uh, with the public. Not, not just releasing a report you know, that sits in a government office, but rather doing a little bit more than that. Um, making sure uh, people uh, have an opportunity to, to engage with the sites or with the collections and with the information uh, that's being learned. And that information uh, potentially can make contributions not just to people's general knowledge and education, but also for future uh, policy making decisions and planning. I gave you just one example about how archaeology is important for making policy decisions in the future about our, our changing climate and sea level. But uh, that, that's only one example. And uh, we, we could be here for several days or have a, a whole semester talking about uh, policy decisions uh, where archaeology could be important. But what I want to do uh, now is just leave you with returning to these questions I proposed right at the beginning of, of the lecture. Um, you know, what can we learn uh, from archaeology uh, today? And you know, are, are those lessons meaningful or relevant in some way? Hopefully I've given you uh, a new perspective about what archaeology is and potentially how it can help towards solving problems that, that are in our modern world and, and for in our future concerns, you know, not, not just in Guam, but you know, worldwide concerns about uh, where we're headed uh, in our future. So with that, I want to say thank you, everybody, for being here. And I believe uh, we still have a little bit of time in this room, so. Uh, okay, I'm intrigued about the idea of the cross-site comparison. Um, and so I was wondering if you would be able to um, talk a little bit about that in terms of what you had seen at the Texan. Um, and if there was another site within the, the CNMI that you would have the opportunity to examine deeply. Sure. For sure. Um, <clears throat> in the cross-regional perspective, uh, the first most important thing is making sure you look at another site that's the same, the same age. Right? You don't want to compare things that are different ages. And one of the advantages of uh, the, uh, the Texan site is it, it has a complete sequence, you know, from 1500 BC all the way up through the you know, Spanish Chamorro Wars, you know, late, late 1600s or, you know, to by 1700 you know, is pretty much the end of the, the archaeological component. So you have the complete sequence. So is there another site in the region that has a complete sequence uh, chronologically? And, y and yet, yes, there are some. Um, uh, in my own work, that would be at the, uh, the Taga House in Tinian and at uh, Baput in uh, Saipan. And so that's three sites actually fortuitously on three different islands uh, that, that all have the complete sequence uh, in time. And I've been able to clarify the same sea level change, the same coastal ecology change, 
uh, effects uh, how people responded to that coastal ecology change like around 1100 BC was pretty much the same in terms of targeting different kinds of shellfish uh, uh, certain kinds of shellfish just could not survive that change in the ecology and others seem to be affected by uh, people harvesting them All right so um, the the kind of shellfish that were affected by sea level are these uh, anadara clams these clam shells that you, you won't find in many places uh, today. There's some in Opera Harbor area and then a few other places, but generally they did not survive in large healthy numbers uh, throughout uh, the archipelago. Um, uh, and, and, that, and that's really clear. But there's other things like say uh, sea urchins or chitin uh, or limpets uh, that whatever time period people first started living somewhere uh, they, they died out or, or became not, not extinct, but uh, depopulated in that localized area uh, very quickly. So for example, you could look at a site that dates not very old, you know, maybe 1,000, I'd say not very old, 1,000 years ago, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it still has, you know, chitin and sea urchin and, and limpets in the very first oldest layer, but then those disappear quite quickly. And that has nothing to do with sea level. You know, it's at every time period, regardless of what the sea level or coastal ecology was. So that tells you, yes, there are certain things that are affected by, by people. And there are others like the Anadara clams that definitely were affected by, by the sea level change. Uh, so that, that's one way you could look at the, the, cro the cross-regional um, comparison ju just within the CNMI. And then the, the other thing you can do is expand that at a, at a larger scale, right? And we can look at places like uh, Fiji, Tonga, uh, New Caledonia, um, where I found the same change, you know, in sea level around 1100 to 1000 BC. The difference is people have been living in those islands not for very long uh, before that happened. But the same coast of ecology did change. So in the Marianas, people have been living here for, you know, 400 years or more before that that change happened, so their response was, was a little bit different uh, than what happened in places like, like Samoa or, or Tonga, where people have been living there just for one or two generations uh, before that coastal ecology changed. So it's, it's, it's a different situation, but the, that cross-regional comparison becomes very important to say, yes, this is a region-wide natural event that really happened, uh, but the cultural response to it is, is specific to that place. And that allows us to get at what I was talking about uh, of you know, what is sustainable and what is not sustainable uh, in different areas. So you, you need that large perspective. Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. In a sense, of hesitance to say these are the tomorrow people. And we definitively say these are tomorrows. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, really so, no, no question um, about that. Is there anything archaeological that where we can learn uh, their governance, the way they... Uh, the way they governed yes. their, their like, political organization? Yes. Yeah, uh, we, we can. Um, in the older time periods, it's a bit unclear, uh, because, just because of the, the way the evidence uh, is. Uh, the best forms of evidence for political organization come from, say, uh, house, house structures, right? Are certain houses, uh, how are they organized and how do they relate with each other? So for the very old time periods, you would need to dig, you know, deep, deep under the ground just to find them. So we don't really see complete houses and villages. We see windows into the past. So we can't really do it for the old, older time periods. Uh, for the Ladi period, however, we can see whole villages and reconstruct how things were organized. And we can look for, uh, say, different, differential patterns in uh, who had access to different kinds of resources. Were, were some houses or villages controlling or situated in, in places that would control uh, access to things like uh, water resources, or yeah, you know, and that that starts to get at, what, at your question, uh, but, but it, it doesn't really answer it. But it starts getting you in the right direction. So we can start to come up with some ideas about that. 
uh, but given the nature of the archaeological evidence, we haven't really been able to address it conclusively. Can you say they were free people? I can't say. Uh, I can't say yes or no. Uh, ba based purely on the archaeological evidence, I, I couldn't say that. For that, I actually would think the best clues would be in the Chamorro language about uh, kinship and uh, how things are organized. Now, most speaking as you know, an archaeologist and anthropologist, I can say worldwide, most societies have a, a, a natural biological division of labor based on you know, are you younger, younger or older, and male and female, because all, all of us, whether we like it or not, have, have those, th those traits. And that's just a natural way of dividing the labor that needs to be done you know, to, to, you know, to maintain your society. So uh, what are the words in Chamorro language that refer to those, those kinds of things? And are there clues in the Chamorro language about labor organization? Like how are ta tasks um, visualized. Actually, Leonard Iriarty is right here. He's the best person I know to talk about that. Do you want to comment? Uh, no, I don't have a comment on that, by the way. No, but thank you. Yeah. How about the description that we are a matriarchal society? Is that evident in archaeology? Uh, no, no, that's not evident in archaeology, but it's, but it's definitely clear in, in language, and it's definitely clear uh, cross-regionally, looking at places where cultural traditions have, you know, survived through that, you know, colonial uh, imperialistic, you know, period, you can look at places uh, all across Micronesia that definitely retained a, a matrilineal clan um, formation. Yeah, definitely. And some of the genetic studies seem to point to that as as well, but that that's. Uh, uh, that's not 100% conclusive. So I would say the, the, the weight of evidence right now is pointing toward, yeah, matrilineal society. And then the only question would be how far back in time do you extend it? And uh, based on the cross-regional you know, splits of, of language and societies you know, in archeological time, uh, that would be at least uh, 2,000 years ago. And it probably is older than that. That's the best I can say. <laughs> um, I have a question, Mike. Um, in the slides that you displayed of the, uh, it was an overview of the detected sites, yes. Yes. and you were showing human activity over time yes. uh, right along the coastal yes. part of the site. I thought on the last slide I noticed that you have. Uh, Let's see if I can get to it. Yeah, you have. Uh, I thought I saw an indication of human activity at the top of the. Yeah. Yeah. At the top of the cliff. Yeah, that, that started, um, you can't see it, it's too small there, but you, it's too small on this slide, but on, in the final one, yes, it's definitely. Slide there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that large, see, large one you know. see, that large spot you see up there is, yes. a, is a cave. Uh, and that, that happens to be the cave where um, famous person Hans Hornbostel uh, went to excavate in the 1920s. And in his notes, which are sparse, uh, he was led to that cave. And he didn't identify the informant who led him there, but the informant told him this is a cave where the, Sp the Spaniards, well, whatever that means, um, had uh, destroyed Chamorro skulls. Uh, <laughs> you can interpret that in different ways. Um, and so he went to excavate in that cave and confirmed that it did have some disturbed pits and some partial uh, human remains and, and broken pottery uh, that looked like you know, very typical Laddie period pottery. Uh, it's a very difficult and dangerous cave to access. It's a s straight vertical cliff 30 feet up. <laughs> and uh, inside is full of uh, bat guano. <laughs> and uh, all I was able to do was just verify that th this was the cave. It matched his, his map location. He made a, a, a drawing of like a plan view and a section view. 
And I, I was able to match that it, it fit his description and I found the trench that he had excavated. So I know that's the place, but I wasn't really interested in digging through a pile of bat guano uh, <laughs> or anything like that. And knowing, knowing, knowing that this was a, a, a burial and ancestral cave, I really, you know, that, that's really what we need to know. And there's really no, no business, you know, intruding from the guy. You said cave singular, but um, on your on your uh, display there, is that more than one location at the cliff that, that you... Uh, th th there, there are a few others that are uh, areas of pottery scatters that are dense uh, pottery scatters that are signed and then by looking in, in the in the soil uh, indicators that survived in there this is very shallow over the limestone right um, these, these look like uh, just a few houses uh, uh, in, in the limestone at, at that time you know, in these higher elevations so not not whole villages but you know kind of the way we use uh, ranchos today, you know, a similar, similar uh, kind of use of, of the out, outer forests at that, at that time. I have a question, Mike. You mentioned the Chamorro Wars. What evidence have you come up with in regard to indicators of the Chamorro, Spanish Chamorro Wars at, that, at the Latekjan site? That's actually just in, in written documents. Um, the, the Jesuits made an, an outpost uh, at, at the site. That was a chapel that is located there, right? Well, it's not, uh, it, it, it was a, a chapel plus a few other things. And then it was rebuilt a number of times. And according, the, the way the Jesuit records worked, uh, sometimes the location was not really here. It may have been at Hanopsen, but anyway. Um, there are d direct you know, references to, to that spot. And we did find the traces of, of where it was. It's, it's been destroyed you know, now, and it no longer exists. But the, the traces of it are, are under the ground now. And so uh, 1670s through 1680s is where, when this was in operation. And there's references to specific things that happened right there, uh, including using uh, Lati uh, they're taking you know, Tassa and, and Haligi to make some of the foundations of, of one of the buildings. That's why I'm asking if there was any evidence of that. I mean, you have the site, and other archaeologists have confirmed that there has been, or there was a chapel there. Yep. But what evidence, in relationship to the narrative that's existing, did you find at the Tegden for that? Well, you find the traces of the building itself, you know, under the ground, and yeah, and then at some of the Lati, not all of them, we do find uh, glass beads and large, you know, square-cut uh, iron uh, from from ships that date. Uh, they they could only date to the the late 1600s, so that puts you in that time range. And then knowing, and then the archaeological evidence also points to everything being abandoned uh, shortly thereafter. You know, like by the year 1700, nobody li living at, at the site as, as, as a village. Uh, and then the next evidence we see is in like uh, the early 1800s as a Spanish crown land uh, being used as an agricultural area. And, and that's when those, those large crater shaped wells were, were dug into the area. And we find some uh, uh, blue on white porcelain that dates to the, the 1820s um, uh, around, around those wells. So yeah, that, that's the next use. It's like more than 100 years later, you know. So uh, for, we can be fairly confident point, just say like the year 1700. It could be a little earlier, but 1700, uh, by that time, the village system would, would have been abandoned, but the place would have been used in a different way or perceived in a different way. Yes. Uh, could you briefly describe what the area was like pre contact around 1450? Around 1450. Okay. It would look similar to what you see here on this image. Not, not exactly, but similar to this. So the coral reef that you see today is the same coral reef that would have been there at, at that time. The places where you gather water, like the seeps that come out just above sea level, would have been in the same places that, that you see today. The extent of the village 
like Laddy Village is pretty much what I show here. This, it, it shows one big continuous thing. It actually was probably two villages, but close enough that we would draw it as, as one large, large area. And then a number of outlying, like um, out, outpost type houses uh, in the upper limestone forest, as well as caves that are used for specialized purposes. Um, and uh, importantly, the coral reef would have been similar to what it is today. And that includes um, a number of openings in it. One, one of them you can almost see on this, on this image, um, one of the openings in, in the reef. And that's very important uh, for communication with the rest of the world, uh, especially going across the Rota Channel. Um, if you, uh, th there's actually uh, many uh, traditions connecting uh, Rota and, and northern Guam, and I, I would like to learn more about that. But uh, archaeologically, I can say that, like the pottery traditions we find in, in northern Guam, especially at the Texan site, uh, share more similarities with Rota than they do with, with southern Guam. So I think that's quite fascinating. But uh, more about your question, what did the place look like? Uh, that's pretty much the extent of what I can say uh, as an archaeologist. Uh, the forest composition is something people ask. And it would have looked, uh, the way the wildlife, wildlife refuge looks today is a actually a really good indicator uh, of what it would have looked like during pre-contact times. There would have been, is, uh, n it would, would have been a place with uh, different kinds of forest. Um, man what we would call managed forest. Not, not virgin natural forest, but managed forest. So people are selecting the kinds of things that are useful for them, but they're not like high density uh, uh, orchards. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely forest grow, growing by itself, but people are just selecting things like uh, the kinds of wood they need for their houses, the kinds of food they want to eat, and, 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 and so forth. And, and we find that not, not only living today, but in, in the archaeological deposits, you know, we find burned, burned wood or char pieces of what we will call charcoal in, in our terminology. And you can look at the wood structure and you can identify you know, what that was. Mostly what people are burning, like in their hearths and, and cooking areas, is, is coconut. Uh, but there are other things as well. Yeah. Um, how many, to the best of your knowledge, how many students uh, to this work have received graduate degrees altogether, and how many of them are UOG students? Okay, uh, UOG students, we, we need to get more. Uh, I, I wish that more of them came tonight, but hopefully that we can encourage them to watch, watch online. Um, <clears throat> We had just a few field, field training schools uh, at the site, uh, which were very successful. One of those students now is completing her master's degree in Micronesian studies at UOG, so we just need to encourage her to finish. <laughs> and that, that will be uh, ec just excellent to see. Uh, and uh, there's another student uh, also working on his uh, master's degree in, in Micronesian studies who, who had worked at, at the site. So that, that's two, and that's at a graduate level, which is excellent. Um, at the undergraduate level, there's uh, uh, one of those two that I just mentioned, plus uh, UOG students, uh, eight others, who all went on uh, to do their own things. Uh, some of them uh, uh, have received their master's or PhD degrees at, at other universities and have come back to work in the private sector or at uh, Guam Preservation Trust or other places. And it's just really good to see that. Uh, we, and I hope to do more of it. Uh, those numbers, you know, eight or ten students, that, that's not enough. <laughs> but it's, it's a start. Yeah. You mentioned about the language possibly being able to give us a better clue as to governance and maybe other aspects of yes. human life at that yeah. particular time period yeah. yes. of the tomorrow way of life. Yes. One of the one of the terms that not maybe a series of terms that has been boggling my mind because I cannot for the life of me, in consideration of timelines, yeah. is are the terms that are used to refer to the that thing. Is it possible? Well, I think it is, and that's what people mean when we say that the, 
for referring to both the upper section and the lower section. The lower section we refer to as Haliki, which is indigenous, mm -hmm. but the upper section is Salsa, which is Spanish. Yes. yes. How could that be? Yeah, I mean, um, there are other forms that have that particular shape in the Tomorrow language. You just mentioned about the, the findings of remnants of the coconut. Yeah. Why is it called Haliki, or why hasn't it been referred to as Haliki, I mean, excuse me, as Haikwas at the top, so ha and Haliki shell at the bottom, and the entire structure not okay. Um, can I'm, you have I'm, something I, 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 that can okay. unboggle my mind here? Okay, uh, I can't, I'm not the best person to answer that question completely. I can start to answer, then I'm going to need to defer to Leonard uh, in a minute here. But to start the answer, uh, Haliki is a word you will find throughout the Malayo-Polynesian world. Uh, not, not throughout, but in, in the West, uh, throughout island Southeast Asia, and it refers to a, ho a house post, you know, something raised up. When you get to Central and Eastern Pacific you know, in Polynesia t today, their houses no longer are raised, their ancient houses are raised on posts, and then around 1,000 years ago, something changed, and people started making houses um, on ground level. You know, with a uh, stone stonework foundations, uh, so their words for houses became really different. So you will not see the word haligi in in Polynesia uh, today. They may have had that word in older times. Uh, so haligi as a house post is is a really strong old, old word in 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 often in the Austronesian world, and then. It's easy to see how that would be applied to the the house post of, of a lati. You, you asked the archaeological evidence, so um, looking at the older sites that are that are before lati, um, again those are beneath the ground, right? So what we find are traces of where wooden posts used to be, and we can outline depending how large the excavation is, we can start to identify what the house looked like. The best we can identify now are rectangular houses raised on wooden posts and those wooden posts were um, sometimes chopped at the end to make a point because we, we can see the point shape in the ground and then we can see stone bracing uh, around them and we find that pattern not only coastal but also uh, in, in inland settings. Uh, in the coastal settings sometimes they were right at the shoreline or even between the high and low tide Right, so uh, fascinating um, the, the way you would construct a house that way. So I think looking long, again, looking long term at how houses were made, you know, in the beginning and then through time may give you some idea of the changing technology uh, of how houses were built and their role in, in the society. Over time, we also can see larger populations and more and more houses packed together in villages. That also may have influenced the way people made houses. And there's something like around the year 1000, not only in Guam and the Marianas, but throughout the Pacific, we see uh, this explosion in population, people living everywhere. Uh, and also expressing themselves in very distinctive ways. And we have the Lati here, have other stone monuments in, in other parts of, of Micronesia, uh, the uh, pigeon snaring mounds of Samoa and Tonga, and the, these large religious uh, complexes and dance platforms in East Polynesia. So that happened like all at once. So people living everywhere with the potential for contact, uh, across, but at the same time formalizing you know, their identity in, in stone. You know? So things literally were fixed in stone uh, at that time. So I think that, that sort of context about, uh, for whatever reasons, um, uh, a need to have an identity that's expressed in, in stone may be a big clue about uh, why, why Lati were made the way they are, and it may uh, be, be some clue about the, 
the origin of, of the word uh, lati, like you were saying, to chip away at something. Actually, that, that actually really makes sense uh, in some way. And the, the improved stratagem also really makes sense. So, you know, Chamorro people are clever, as we know. So may, maybe it was a play on words even, you know. So the, there's, there's many things to consider there. So I, I, I hope I've answered. Did that give you enough? Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your being here. And Mike, we uh, want to show you just how much we appreciate your being here by giving you some food coupons from our sponsors. And you can exchange it if you're, when you're here on the island. I have this certificate here that I want to hand to you. All right, thank you very much for giving us your time. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mike Carson.